Did you know that the system lean DTCs, the PO-171s and the PO-174s, are among the top 10 DTCs that technicians deal with on a daily basis? Well, they are. In fact, they come in at number three. But if, how are you going to understand how to repair these DTCs if you don't understand what caused them to set in the first place? It all has to do with the fuel control that the ECM is trying to exercise, trying to keep that mixture perfect in those cylinders. When it gets out of whack, codes set, misfires occur, all kinds of drivability issues can happen. It's all about the fuel trims. That's the topic of this edition of The Trainer. Hey everybody, thanks for watching this edition of The Trainer. Now in this series that we started back in January, we're setting the building blocks to develop our skills as drivability technicians. We've talked about how the ECM thinks. We've looked at the resources and modes of global OBD2 and how we can use them as di diagnostic tools. And now we're gonna look at fuel trims. Specifically, how does the ECM maintain fuel control? What are the factors that we need to consider when we're either diagnosing system lean, system rich codes, or using the fuel trim data as another diagnostic tool for other drivability conditions that we're going to face. So let's start off with talking about this. Numero uno, the main job of the ECM is to protect this device, the catalytic converter. That's the last step in line to clean up whatever exhaust gases have passed through the engine, isn't it? And before they're released to the atmosphere, this is the number that the OEMs are being held responsible for. What is coming out of those pipes? Now, this is a very efficient device. As long as what's going in maintains itself in a very narrow range. What I mean by that is that we all know that to get the right combustion, we want to have what's called a lambda ratio of air and fuel being placed in the engine and then properly combusted. In other words, we have to have the right compression. We have to have the ignition happen at the right moment. If everything works as the way it's supposed to be, then the gases coming out, the spent gases coming out, are going to be maintained in that very narrow range. Uh, these feed gases, as they're called, that are being passed into the catalytic converter. If for some reason we have a higher than normal oxygen content or higher than normal fuel content, for whatever reason, passing into the converter, the converter will overheat and the substrate will start to melt and come apart. In fact, when I'm dealing with catalytic efficiency codes, one of the first things I like to do is try to get a peek at what the substrate looks like. If I see that it's been melted or overheated, well, I know right away the converter is garbage and it's going to have to be replaced. But I also know that I have to find out why that converter overheated and repair that issue. Because if I don't, then the new converter that I install is going to have a very, very short life indeed. So again, it's all about the converter and what's going into it. Now we all know about this, right? The stoichiometric ratio, lambda ratio, goes by a couple of different uh, names. Uh, the 14.7 to one. Now this isn't always the case nowadays. Some of these vehicles are running much leaner than this and doing it very efficiently. Uh, we're not here to debate that. What I want you to understand by it is again, the ECM is charged with feeding the right amount of fuel to the air coming in. And it goes by not volume, but by weight. And that's what a lot of technicians don't understand. So let me kind of give you an illustration for that. Here you see at the top, we have a couple of measuring cups, two and a half cups to be exact. Two and a half cups of fuel weighs about one pound uh, in terms of this ratio that we're looking at, the 14.7 to one. Now the 14.7 pounds of air that has to go with it, well imagine one square inch that extends from the floor 50 miles straight up. That's how we determine atmospheric pressure. That's the 14.7 PSI that we're all familiar with. You want to have another little imaginary picture in your mind of what that is? Well, consider one square foot, one square foot extending 182 feet straight up. That column of air is going to weigh 14.7 pounds. So that's what we're looking at. How much air uh, max with how much fuel to give us the correct ratio to provide the correct feed gases to who? The catalytic converter. That's right. Okay. Now, what does the ECM need to know before it can add the right amount of fuel? Well, of course, it needs to know how much air. 
and how much air by weight got into the engine. Now there's two processes that we use for that. The older one is the MAP or speed density system that uses the manifold air pressure sensor and others so that the engine or ECM can calculate how much air got into the vehicle. So it's not a direct measurement, it's, it's an inferred measurement based on the data provided by these sensors. Now where does that come into play for us as diagnosticians? Your ears should be perking up right about now because if any of those sensors are not telling the truth, then obviously the calculation that the ECM is going to make will be wrong and that can lead to drivability issues, can it? The other method that is commonly used is the mass airflow system. Now the mass airflow sensor does indeed accurately measure how much air is getting into the engine. But just like I said with the MAP sensor, the uh, speed density system, if the MAP sensor is not telling the truth, and we've all seen MAP sensors be, uh, became contaminated and, and misreported or had electrical issues, whatever the case might be, if it's not telling the ECM what's really going on, then of course any calculations that the ECM makes is going to be wrong in error, right? But so that's the first thing the ECM needs to know, how much air is getting into the system. Now here's something the ECM already knows. It knows that the engine it's now in charge of is fitted with a certain type of fuel injector and it knows what that fuel injector's flow rate is. And since it knows what the flow rate is under a given pressure and volume of fuel, then it knows if it turns it on for X amount of time, whatever that might be, the pulse width that you see on your scan tool, that that fuel injector will deliver X amount of fuel. And it calculates, again, all of this by weight. So once it's measured the air, it can then go through its calculations and determine how long to turn the injector on to deliver the correct amount of fuel. Remember what I said about the sensors though? What if there is something amiss with anything in the fuel delivery side? What if the fuel pressure is low? What if there's a restriction to that volume? What if the injector is sticking? What if it's not opening properly or it's restricted? All of these will affect the end results, won't it? The ECM needs to know a way, or it needs to have a way to know when that happens. And that's where we come to here, what the ECM isn't sure of. There can be manufacturing variations on a brand new car. So the calculations it makes are gonna be pretty darn close, but they're not gonna be spot on. And then of course, as the vehicle wears, as there's a wear and tear age on the vehicle, these parameters are going to change as well. So we have to have a way to get some kind of feedback to tell that ECM exactly what happened after it made its calculation and it fired that injector, okay? And that comes from oxygen sensors. They're either the conventional oxygen sensors that, that uh, older vehicles have or the wideband sensors that are very commonly used. This is the feedback to the ECM of what really happened. And uh, let's start off with the conventional oxygen sensor. The conventional oxygen sensors, I want to, I want to uh, stress right now, are not sensors. Okay? They do not measure anything. They react, and they react to the oxygen content in the exhaust stream and then report that information back to the ECM. And because they react, because they don't physically measure something, we have to do something that will cause those sensors to react in different directions. We have to get it what's, what we call switching. We have to get it moving across its neutral point, that 0 0.450 millivolts, that we, uh, or that 450 millivolts that um, you see on your scan tool as the mid-range for the sensor. What's its upper and lower limits? So, yeah, 0 0.1 on the bottom, maybe 0 0.8, 0 0.9 at top. Uh, and we're looking to go from 0 0.1, the lean side, to 0.9, the rich side, and, and get it to go back and forth. We'll talk a little bit more of that in, in a moment. Now, of course, the wideband sensors, a lot more accurate. They're actually providing feedback and are more sensitive to these ultra lean conditions that a lot of the engines are running nowadays. But the aim is the same, no matter which one is in play. That's what tells the computer how it's doing, so the ECM, the computer, can make its adjustments. That's what we see in the short-term fuel trim and long-term fuel trim. More on that here in a second. Um, but again, everything that we talked about so far, that's, that's implying that they're all working the way they're supposed to be working. So as a diagnostic uh, technician, I'm, my ears are perking and going like, well, here's something else I got to make sure of before I condemn another part. I've got to make sure that these feedback sensors are telling the truth and that they're coming online. We're going into what we call closed loop. 
Um, nowadays, that happens very quickly. Back on some of the older cars, even the OBD1 cars, it took a while to heat up that conventional oxygen sensor, get, to get that thing online and reacting to the content in the exhaust stream. And it wasn't unusual for them to go offline while you were sitting there idling at a stoplight because there wasn't enough heat in the exhaust to keep it fired up. So uh, we want to make sure we look at that pit on our scan tool, make sure that we're in closed loop, make sure that we are indeed providing feedback to the ECM through these sensors. Now let's talk a little bit about the role of STFT, that's the short-term fuel trim pit on your scan tool, LTFT, that's the long-term fuel trim, of course, and the rear fuel trim. Rear fuel trim, if you don't know about it, hang on, we'll get there. But as diagnostic technicians, it's all about what the total fuel trim is. What's the total amount of correction that the ECM is making at any given time? Let's start off talking about short-term fuel trim. As I mentioned, uh, let's, we'll, we'll focus on the conventional oxygen sensor uh, analogy here first. As I said, the oxygen sensor, conventional oxygen sensor, doesn't measure oxygen. It reacts to the presence of oxygen in the exhaust stream. So let's just look at it this way. I'm the ECM, and I go ahead and I send out a pulse to, to my injector. And when it gets through the oxygen sensor, the oxygen sensor says, oh, a little too much oxygen. That was a little on the lean side. So its voltage level drops. I see that. And I'm thinking to myself that, okay, I want to get that to go the other way. Because what I really like to do is keep this back and forth across a neutral point, a zero point. So I'm going to say, okay, I'm going to make a correction and I'm going to add a little bit more fuel the next time around. That's the short-term fuel trim that we see on our, on our scan tool. So I add a little bit more. I wait for the reaction from the oxygen sensor. It goes up now, indicating, okay, you did good, went a little too far, that's a little rich. So I say, okay, that's fine, I'm the ECM, I'm going to make another adjustment, I'll take a little bit away, and I'm going to move back down on my uh, pulse width, and that's going to cause the short-term fuel trim to drop the other way. So when it goes lean, uh, when the uh, um, oxygen sensor goes uh, lean, short-term goes rich. When the oxygen sensor goes rich, short-term fuel trim goes lean. And let me be a little more clear about that. The short-term fuel trim is a number that's actually a percentage that's either added or taken away from the computer's base calculation in order to, that, for that turning on that injector, the amount of time that the injector is going to be on for, that pulse width, if you will. Okay, everybody with me so far? So the short-term fuel trim is a percentage adjustment. So when you see that number, plus six, that's 6% more than the base calculation. Minus six, minus per six percent less than the base calculation. And the whole idea again is to get that oxygen sensor to switch back and forth across that 450 millivolt center between that 0 0.1 and 0 0.8, 0 0.9 uh, on a healthy sensor. And as long as we're doing that and the short-term fuel trim is switching back and forth across its zero point, then we're in fuel control and everybody's happy. Now, ideally, I want to see the short-term fuel trim to cross that zero point no more than plus or minus 5%, ideally. If I see plus or minus 10, my eyebrows are going to pop up. Could be an indication that there's an issue. Maybe that oxygen sensor is getting a little old. It's not reacting as fast as it should, and that's kind of giving the wrong information to the computer. So maybe that's why it's making such a wide switch. And certainly if I see it outside that plus or minus 10%, I know there's a problem that I want to take a look at. Now the computer knows that too. And it still can do, and it can do something about that. When it sees that it's trying to make a correction to that short term fuel trim, and no matter what it does, it's, that oxygen sensor is staying down low or up high, no matter how much short term it takes away or how much short term it adds and it's not making any headway then the ECM knows it has an issue that it needs to take and make a more permanent correction to. So what it's going to do is part of its base calculation now it's going to start to add a little bit more again in percentage and that's the long term fuel trim number that you see. That's what we do or what the ECM does to accommodate for parts that wear and tear. You know there's going to be some changes that we need to adjust for. So when it sees that it can't quite correct it with its, with its brand new numbers, it's going to slowly start to add long-term fuel trim again until it gets those numbers to start doing the switch back and forth across zero. 
And then once it does, whatever long-term fuel trim correction was needed to make that happen, that's what it's going to store in, in its memory for that particular load and RPM condition, and that's what it'll apply going forward. Now, there will be occasions where we just can't get it. No matter how much we try, the number of short-term and long-term just climb and climb and climb. Generally, when uh, either or both get to uh, plus or minus 25, 35%, those are typical thresholds that the manufacturers use to say, okay, that's just, that's too much, there's a problem. And if we're adding too much fuel, then obviously we have something causing a, what would be a lean condition, and we're uh, gonna set a system lean code. The opposite, if we're uh, taking away too much fuel, then obviously uh, we have too much going in, or, 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 or a rich condition for some reason, uh, imbalance on the fuel side, and, and then we're gonna start looking at uh, setting a system rich code, okay? So that's basically the long-term and short-term fuel trim, but we're not done yet, okay? Again, for diagnostic purposes, I wanna look at what the total of those two are, and I wanna look at them over time, because the fuel monitor is a continuous monitor. Remember how we define that? That's being run and checked all the time under a variety of load and RPM conditions. And doesn't the fuel needs of the engine change depending on how it's being operated? Of course it does. It takes very little fuel to run at idle, but if I'm pulling a trailer uphill and I put my foot to the floor, I'm going to want a lot of gas real quick. I'm sucking in a lot of air, right? So I'm trying to get more out of it. That uh, we need to look at the load and RPMs that it's being operated under. But that's the diagnostic number that we're looking at. But here's a situation you might run into. What if you add your short-term fuel trim and your long-term fuel trim, and you're fortunate to have a PID for total fuel trim, but they don't match? What is that telling you? Well, then you might be dealing with this. Rear fuel trim. Rear fuel trim uh, is a correction that's made based on input from the oxygen sensor downstream of the catalytic converter. And this is uh, mostly later model cars. I think the first things I started seeing was somewhere around 2003, 2004 and up. Um, uh, many manufacturers use this as, a, as another method of maintaining fuel control. Because this is what's looking what's coming out of the catalytic converter. Um, typically, not a huge correction factor, but if there's something going wrong or something happens to the front sensors on a lot of vehicles, the rear trim will now become the primary source of feedback to the ECM. And you can see that. You'll either see big numbers if the rear fuel trim pit is there, or you'll add up short term, long term, and see that it ain't anywhere near close to what your total fuel trim is telling you on your scan tool. Um, and, or you can look at the rear bank sensors. So there's, there's, be aware that you may have an issue with rear fuel trims, and if you do, it's probably because you have an issue with the front sensors on that, on that bank. Now, what do you think of when I say lean or rich? Are you focused on just the amount of fuel going in? Well, if you were in the carburetor days, we sure did, because we didn't really measure the air going in. That kind of took care of itself. Uh, if we had a lean condition, we we're running probably a fuel jet that was being clogged or jets too small for the application. If we were running rich, float levels, uh, jets that fall out, all kinds of things that could cause that. But we really didn't factor in the air so much. What I want to stress here on this screen, uh, if you're dealing with, and we'll look at this more closely when we actually do troubleshooting on system lean, system rich codes, is that all the things that we talked about so far play a role in whether or not that fuel trim is correct, whether that fuel trim is being measured and executed properly. It has to do with, again, to recap, are we properly measuring the air going in? Is the ECM being told the truth? Is it getting an accurate picture? Uh, if it's not, then that's going to skew the trims. Is the fuel delivery side to spec? Even minor variances there can impact the end result and whether we have a system lean or system rich situation. Are the feedback sensors providing the information correctly and telling the computer the truth? So there's a lot of things in there that the ECM is relying on, a lot of, lot of devices, a lot of sensors that it's depending on for accurate information. And if any of them don't provide that accurately, that can affect your fuel trims. So you wanna make sure we keep that in mind. Another thing I want you to keep in mind is that fuel trims aren't static. Like I said, they're, they're changing over a variety of load and RPM conditions. So one of the things that we'll get into uh, a little later on is I'll show you how to do what's called, uh, a lot of our contributors call a flat rate test drive. This is where we go out and operate the vehicle. 
on a known route under uh, the same conditions as we do every other vehicle while we're tracking certain data pids and recording them, graphing them on our scan tools. That's the most ideal way to take a look at a lot of this data is in graph format because then you can see changes under these different condi conditions and you're not trying to get a snapshot of, of those little individual snippets that you see when you just have a data PID screen showing. So learn how to graph those on your scan tool. Today's scan tools have come a long way and, and provide very accurate graphs for our diagnostic purposes. I also want to make sure you understand that fuel trims have to be considered by bank and not by the total engine package. Now we all know V6s, V8s, we have a left and right bank but there are a lot of inline four cylinders that if you look very closely are also divided into two banks. Typically cylinders one and four and cylinders two and three and they each have their own feedback sensors whether it's conventional or, or more commonly wideband sensors in place on those engines. And again, I can't stress enough, we have to look at the operating conditions occurring at the time that we're looking at the fuel trims. They can vary quite a bit and we'll demonstrate that in future episodes. In fact, the next time on the trainer, we're going to take a look at fuel trims. We're going to take a look at that flat rate test drive, and we're going to use that information and apply it to helping us diagnose the cause of another very common DTC, misfire DTCs. Hey, I'm Pete Meyer, Motor Age Magazine. Thanks for watching this edition of the trainer. I hope you found it helpful, and I'll see you next month.